Alrighty, um, let's come to order. Um, I want to welcome everybody here. Today we only have one topic in front of us, and it's a massive one, um, and we'll, we'll get to that. But uh, looking forward on, on Thursday is uh, kind of the homeless day, uh, I believe at the Capitol and also here. We're going to hear a number of bills, including Senator Dibbles and some others, um, about homelessness. And I'm quite interested um, if anybody is listening in ahead of that time, and you all should be listening, it's just that good of a program. Um, right, Senator Hoffman? You know, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I really want to thank you for bringing that up because this, you know, according to some folks, this is the most watched uh, committee in the whole state of Minnesota right now. And so I think there's something to be said about according that. According to Senate media and my mother, it's you, probably the most popular. It, it, coming from Sandy Abler <laughs> means a lot, Mr. Chair. There you go. What do you think? Maybe thank we you. should get this. Steam, anyway, steam so, so. Um, but what I'm hoping to get out of that discussion also is uh, how the homeless providers are handling uh, any job search, uh, job enabling facilitation, uh, people moving along the continuum to become more self-reliant because I hope that we can get something done with that. And then Tuesday we're going to be taking up uh, the behavioral health, uh, I guess we'll call it reform at uh, DHS, trying to get it out of the basement into a place that it can do um, the good it should without any criticism of anything in DHS, just it's a structural thing. Um, and then we're going to be talking, I think, about gas prices. Uh, that's uh, news suddenly uh, for the NEMT providers. They're about to go out of business, which means no one on Medicaid in greater Minnesota could get to where they have to go. And so they get sick enough to need an ambulance ride, which we'll pay for those. Um, and apparently there's no mechanism for us to uh, address that issue without passing a bill. So we'll talk about that. And then also, there's a very famous Senator Hoffman bill, which we're going to attempt to get to for our third time, third time but we'll see. So I, I even bring, the, I bring the, the thing down, Mr. Chair, uh, in the hopes that perhaps, you know, we can slide it in, you know, to JP's uh, schedule here. But uh, So Ms. Grom, we're, uh, is she listening? <laughs> it could be the day. This is Lucy and the football. Um, but on a much more sober um, topic here, uh, we're going to take up competency restoration, which uh, has nothing less than tragic uh, results. Uh, and just so people know the plan, um, we're going to be working on this today until we get to a point to vote to send both these bills to judiciary. I believe there's some amendments coming uh, to uh, Senate File 3728. I don't know if there are any for 3395. Um, and so the general plan today is we're going to hear from Michelle Simpson, uh, the mother of Abigail Simpson, and her picture is on my computer. Um, and just a tragic thing that just should never have happened. And thank you for being here, Ms. Simpson. Uh, then we're going to talk to the counties a little bit about current, um, uh, this, she's not on the agenda for this, but um, Ms. Ellis, you'll be coming to talk about current events at the counties, uh, what particularly, well, we'll get into that later, but so we're going to talk about that. Then we're going to hear the, uh, the Sengem bill and go through a little bit about that, and then we'll hear the, the 3728 and uh, see where the discussion goes. So um, and hopefully Senator Bigham will be joining us for the last bill. She's my uh, chief co-author. And Senator Housley is, well, no, they're both chief co-authors. They're both amazing co-authors. Why can't you all be number one? <laughs> anyway, so, um, and so just to, to set it up here, uh, we had a hearing about this this summer. Uh, there are people who commit crimes all the time and someone does a particularly bad crime and they're in front of the judge and they're deemed to be unable to participate in their own defense. And since we don't put incompetent people in jail, we have a way to try to help them out. And so it used to be before December of 2018, DHS took the responsibility, actually kind of of their own good graces. There was, turns out there was no rule making them do that. And they would put them in AMRTC or somewhere and get them competent. They could then go stand for trial um, and be about their business with whatever happened in the courts. Uh, then, but if people are deemed incompetent, unable to participate in their own defense, they are actually, unless they need a hospital level of care, then they go back into AMRTC. But once they're out of there, then they're released into the community or into their own home or to a group home or whatever. And as, as of uh, November of that time, I believe the count was 696 people were turned loose. And unfortunately, a number of them have committed heinous crimes. Um, and the prosecutor was not allowed, and the county attorney was not allowed to 
keep them because they were incompetent. And furthermore, if they go commit a misdemeanor like assault of somebody or DWI or something, those aren't charged, or at least they're dismissed if they are charged. And so, holy cow. And um, I met Ms. Simpson this summer. She came to our committee, and it was just so, I don't know, it's, it's it, some people you never want to forget, and may it never happen again. And that's the point of today's hearing and starting the process in the Senate. So, Ms. Simpson, I'm not going to steal any more of your thunder, but I'm so grateful that you found time. And uh, I think you can spend a good deal of the hour, the, the time with us, and maybe at the end we'll ask you to comment again. But, you know, if you have, uh, you know, eight or ten minutes to tell us yeah. just your story, I would. I think I'll only talk for about six minutes, but I did have to prepare because there's no way okay. I can remember. Oh, and Ms. Simpson, I, um, I, we found yeah. this picture of your daughter, and I just, it's just a compelling picture. Would you mind if we uh, screen shared it for so people at home could see it? Sure. Okay. So we'll do that. So we'll, that'll pop up during your talk, but just go right ahead then. Yeah. Yeah. She was beautiful. We miss her every day, all the time. So yes, I'm Michelle Simpson. So you know, now my 21 year old daughter, Abigail was murdered in St. Paul on February 26, 2020. And so it's been two years and it goes without saying, but the pain and the emptiness that comes with bearing a child does not go away. So we will live with a hole in our family for the rest of our lives. And I'll just say that words really just are inadequate to describe this. So it's actually not very easy for me to like keep talking about this. And I ask, I tell my husband this, I don't know if I should stop because it doesn't help. But then I feel like if we can do something to try and prevent something like this from happening to someone else, that's what I, why I keep discussing this. So the individual who killed, I'll just remind everyone, Abigail had suspended criminal felony proceedings due to a finding of incompetence, was civilly committed, and then was provisionally discharged and was living in the community. And so there have been others, other murders, assaults, rapes in Minnesota over the last several years by individuals deemed incompetent with either dismissed or suspended criminal charges as reported elsewhere. So my comments about the proposed bills focus on the perspective of victims, their families, and potential future victims with the hope to prevent horrific tragedies from occurring in the future. I also want to mention that in addition to my experience with living with the pain that comes with bearing a child and two years of trying to understand the gaps, because that's just how my brain works, I try to understand like, you know, what did we miss? What did everybody else miss? What's the statute say? I am also a PhD prepared registered nurse and my professional background just directs me to review research to understand the evidence that exists that can inform a bill such as these. So many of my comments come from published evidence. So just a brief background. I didn't even know what competency restoration was prior to two years ago. Never had even heard of it. But it really involves three main components. It's this, you know, competency restoration maybe sounds more complicated than um, like it has like multiple components. It really just has three. I mean, unless you break down the education component, but medication, medication is recognized as the primary intervention, right? To help address and treat the mental health diagnoses. The second involves abstinence from alcohol and drugs, if that's an issue. And oftentimes it is. Depends what you read, but 20 to 40% of individuals with mental illness also have substance use disorder. So you're not gonna regain competency if you don't take medication, if you have a diagnosis that requires it consistently, and you don't abstain from alcohol or drugs, which includes marijuana, I'll just mention. So treating both is critical. And the third is the educational instruction about understanding your criminal charges, court proceedings, and communicating with your attorney. So, as we know, competency restoration can occur in hospital, jail, and community, or outpatient setting. Community outpatient is the same thing. And <clears throat> the literature states that higher rates of competency restoration occurs in state hospitals. 
so like 80 to 90 percent. Jails, 55 to 86 percent, and community, 54 to 70 percent. So you'll notice restoration, the amount of people that are restored in the community is the lowest. Longer time to restoration is also found to occur in the community setting, somewhere between 149 to 207 days. With the shortest time in jail, there's a term called malingering, and I'm just not going to even get into that, but it's like 57 days because people don't like being in jail. It's like the least desirable place to be. Or the hospital setting, which is 73 days. However, the range is, is longer than that. It can be like one to 560 days. Some research says up to three years. So that, that's just the beginning background. So the goal in my perspective, and I think everybody agrees, is competency restoration is to help people get access to resources to address their mental health needs to be healthy as possible and regain competence so that their criminal proceedings can resume, not so that we can dismiss them so they can resume and they, they can address, they can deal with the crime that they are alleged to have committed. However, and you already mentioned this in earlier twice today, I think dismissing all misdemeanors is not sensitive enough to public safety nor consistent with addressing the seriousness of domestic violence, which is oftentimes a misdemeanor domestic assault. Um, in HF 2725, I've read both bills, it states that individuals have 60 to 90 days to regain competency, and if the individual does not regain competency, they can dismiss the charge. 90 days is rarely enough time for the brain to begin to heal from substance abuse and or a mental illness episode resulting in competence after charge with the crime. Studies show that 89% of individuals are restored within 180 days, so that's six months. The main point is the crime committed in conjunction with the diagnosis of the individual should be considered. Okay. So my, my second main point now is it's also widely recognized that individuals who are appropriate for community-based competency restoration is for adults who pose a low risk to public safety. So if there's anything that's remembered today from what I'm saying, it's about who's being, who's going to be discharged to this community competency restoration. It has to be low risk individuals because I think all of the individuals who committed like murders and worse assaults and rapes already had a previous criminal history. And so in my view, they wouldn't have been considered low risk. So, um, so they, the, the individuals charged with misdemeanors and adhere to medication and do not use alcohol and drugs and are engaged in their treatment are most appropriate for community outpatient restoration. High risk individuals, again, should receive the program in the hospital or jail. I think jail is one of the options in one of these bills. So there's also a mention of use of a risk assessment in one of the bills to determine if supervision is necessary. I think it's not line 9.15 in the House bill. However, there is no specific one identified and the supervision is not entirely the same as determining what setting a person should be housed within. So there's a tool called the public safety assessment. It's PSA. I'm sure others have learned, heard of it. Um, it was developed nearly a decade ago on almost um, like 750,000 individuals who had already committed crimes. And it's used in many states as a valid and reliable assessment, and it should be required, be required to help determine if an incompetent individual would receive competency restoration in an inpatient jail or community setting. It's been found to predict new criminal arrests on pretrial release new violent criminal arrest while on pretrial release, and judicial officers can use this information with other information to make a more informed competency restoration setting decision. So I know that this suggests that more individuals may require inpatient competency restoration. And so I know this was discussed, I think, as well earlier and other bills are proposing that we're it's probably going to be a more need for more inpatient beds. 
just because we don't have more inpatient beds doesn't mean that we have we don't have more people who need that level of care. And I know this is not probably what people want to hear because it's expensive, but I would pay anything to have my daughter back. So one more comment, okay. last comment. Um, of the 3,214 individuals that was reported in that competency restoration task force report from 2016 to 2018, who were initially found incompetent, some by 30 days, many of them had regained competency again because their brain clears because they're so more sober or they started back on their medication. 41% of them were civilly committed. So it's just not clear in the bills um, how the roles of the forensic navigator differs from a case manager for the individuals who are civilly committed. The civilly committed individuals are assigned a county case manager, and there needs to be more clear delineation in the bill as to what each is responsible for in managing and supervising these incompetent individuals, or individuals will continue to be lost in the system. Especially if they like, if an individual is outpatient and they live in a group home, and then you have all those caregivers, and then you have a case manager, and you have a forensic navigator, who's responsible for reporting what to whom if someone's not? So there's also no mention of provisional discharge in this bill, in either bill, nor how DHS determines who can be released on provisional discharge, which kind of goes back to my public safety assessment. Thank you. I have like one more sentence. I also think there should be a separation of the evaluators and treatment providers because it provides, it's a conflict of interest. Right. Which probably requires more discussion so that I can even understand. Um, I think when you have, I think there's pressure from everyone to like find people who would be more appropriate, for example, for outpatient because we don't have enough, you don't have enough inpatient beds. So if you have, Everybody's, if everybody's employed by the same people, there's pressure to like find them to be more appropriate for a setting that's maybe not appropriate. I really, I really do appreciate being able to share my thoughts. I hope this was helpful, like some of the details. Yeah, well, thanks, Ms. Simpson. And I, every word that you offer is helpful. It's. Um, so thank you for being here, and I'm only sorry you've had to become such a knowledgeable person on this topic. Um, Me too. Yeah, and so, I don't know, I, I'm not going to forget your daughter. And, um, you know, neither will you. And so, um, anyway, we, uh, you, you can't see the faces around the table, but we're all just kind of thinking a little bit here, so. Um, anyway, blessings. Stick around with us, please. And at the end, you may have some thoughts that we'll offer you a chance to share. Um, so uh, I, I neglected, thank you. Uh, so I neglected one piece. Uh, DHS wants to give us a little uh, once over on some of this. We spent some time this summer on doing some of this. But Dr. Stevens is here. So before uh, uh, Julie Ellis comes, um, so Dr. Stevens, I don't think we have time to go through all of this, but if you can give us the highlights, maybe a five minute summary of what you would want to have us know, um, knowing that some of us heard some of this stuff this summer. Um, would that be okay? Can you do that? You can fly through and you don't have to tell us every word here, but just kind of give us the big idea. Uh, is that something you can pull off on short notice? Thank you. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Double muted. Sorry about I that. Mean, welcome. Chair. How many times are we going to say that when we're old? Like, oh, what's the funniest thing? Oh. You're muted. Yeah. Anyway, so thanks for the conversation before and just yesterday, and thanks for being here now. So thank yes, you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, and Ms. Simpson, thank you for sharing your story. It's um, always really helpful to, to hear, and um, sorry for your loss. Um, we do have several slides, um, some of which we can go through very quickly, um, but we wanted to just provide a little bit of background for the committee. Uh, mostly about the changes in 2018. Some of you are more familiar than others, and it is um, because you've alluded to a really complex topic. So if we could um, sure. go through those, would that be all right? Yeah, just, sure. Okay. 
Great, so um, I failed to introduce myself. I'm sorry about that. I'm Dr. Kylie Ann Stevens. I'm the Executive Medical Director for Behavioral Health uh, for Drug Care and Treatment. And I am um, a forensic psychiatrist by training. Um, so I spent a lot of time in my career um, thinking about um, competency restoration. So about uh, last year, about 12,000 people received services from DCT's treatment facilities uh, among all of our facilities. Our budget is quite small compared to the overall DHS budget. Next slide. We provide mental health treatment that's not available anywhere else in Minnesota. Um, we do that through um, um, the, our limited bed capacity, which is about 576 beds spread across our eight facilities statewide. Nearly all patients within DHS facilities have been civilly committed. And to be civilly committed, an individual must pose a substantial likelihood of harm to themselves or others due to mental illness, organic disorder of the brain, or intellectual or developmental disability. They must have made a recent threat or attempt at physical harm or have failed to obtain necessarily necessary food, shelter, or care. The goal of civil commitment is not detention. Uh, it's to provide people with mental health care and treatment, which will make that further supervision unnecessary. The goal really is to stabilize the person's mental health condition with that focus on recovery. It's provided by doctors, nurses, other highly trained clinicians. Um, and again, the focus is on transition to that next most important goal, that next uh, level of care. So um, there are two key components to competency restoration, which Ms. Simpson highlighted. Uh, and just briefly, the first consists of mental health treatment to address a person's mental illness um, using medications and other interventions. Um, secondly, there is an educational component, which helps defendants um, to assist in their own defense and prepare for prosecution. That is the goal of competency restoration. It's important to remember that incompetency in and of itself is not a mental illness and competency education is not mental health treatment. Uh, being incompetent does not equate to dangerousness. Lack of stability does. The goals of education are to help individuals understand the charges and penalties they face, work with attorneys to aid in their own defense and behave appropriately in court. Um, it doesn't require any specific expertise and can be taught by most adults with a training guide. So no state law requires DHS or anyone in Minnesota to provide competency treatment or a defendant to undergo it. And just as the law doesn't require provision of that treatment, it doesn't uh, tie provisional discharge to competency attainment or to a determination that a person cannot be restored to competence. So in the past, as you noted, uh, Mr. Chair, DHS did factor competency into discharge decisions. It wasn't required. We did it because we had some limited capacity to do so. Um, as a result, however, many beds in DHS facilities were filled by people who no longer required inpatient treatment. The focus on competency had become a significant barrier to discharge. At the same time, demand for admission to DHS facilities really rose dramatically, driven by the state's 48-hour law. And if you look at these numbers, um, in the next slide, you'll be able to see that um, in 2013, Minnesota statute was amended to require DHS to prioritize admission of certain individuals from jail within 48 hours. By far, most of those have been found incompetent to stand trial. So you can see how rapidly admissions from jails rose in a really pretty short period of time, more than doubling within the first six years. So the result of this was that patients in community hospitals or in the communities uh, waited for weeks or months for admission to state mental health facilities, really effectively cutting off access to everyone else in Minnesota to the DHS beds that are needed, which I liken very much to the ICU intensive care units of behavioral health treatment in the state. Since the law tasked DHS with providing mental health care, um, we continue to face and have faced intense pressure from law enforcement counties uh, families, emergency rooms, um, and others to admit and treat more people. The only way really to do that is to discharge patients to other appropriate settings when they no longer need that level of care. So who are these patients? They're psychiatrically stable, but not necessarily competent to stand trial on the criminal charges. These individuals do not need to be hospitalized, but they take up a great number of beds in DHS facilities. So as noted, to free up treatment capacity in 2018, 
DHS decided that competency to stand trial on the criminal charges would no longer be a determining or the determining factor in provisionally discharging patients. While in our care, patients receive treatment appropriate for their mental illness for as long as it takes to stabilize them. During that time, patients also receive competency education. So we didn't stop providing competency education to people in our care if they need it. However, once patients are psychiatrically stable and no longer require inpatient treatment, we provisionally discharge them to an appropriate setting arranged by county case managers, even if the patients aren't considered competent yet. Individuals are provisionally discharged to a variety of placements, for example, group homes, chemical dependency treatment, and sometimes to jails, if that's the most appropriate setting for them um, and for public safety. Provisional discharge decisions are clinical decisions made in collaboration with county partners, treatment providers, and the patient themselves. A typical provisional discharge plan includes requirements for ongoing psychiatric and medical treatment, uh, substance use treatment, vocational assistance, and so on and so forth. We do not discharge people who are psychiatrically unstable. This process hasn't changed and continues today. Once provisionally discharged from a treatment facility, individuals are no longer in the custody of DHS. We have no authority under law to monitor individuals committed as mentally ill, chemically dependent, or development, developmentally disabled once they're provisionally discharged. Uh, the authority and responsibility is granted solely to the supervising county. And I'd like to close by talking about the impact of the decision in 2018. Um, as expected, the shift has allowed us to admit and treat far more patients, uh, nearly 44% who needed hospitalization at Anoka Metro Regional Treatment Center, which is our state's largest psychiatric hospital. So while not changing provisional discharge requirements, um, to people who are unstable, we're, we're continuing to discharge people who are psychiatrically stable. But by not waiting solely for the competency piece, we've been able to serve far more people um, in this time period. So I appreciate you letting me um, run through the slides very quickly and happy to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you, Dr. Stevens. And we're, we're quick studies, so that quick walkthrough was really very helpful. I just had no idea that the 48 hour rule provoked a lot of this. You do one good thing and another thing. Um, Senator Do you remember, Senator Abler, when we visited, there was a whole bunch of us that went to the uh, Anoka treatment facility out, out there and, and yeah. staff for two and a half hours, the staff were talking about that 48 hour hold that was 2016, 2017, and it was just, yeah. what a difference that made. And are you wanna take questions to the department now? No, Most, I'd, I'd like to- wait? Well, I'd, I'd like to, well, let's just um, take that at face value for now. I, um, there's just a, we've got a large body of work to go through, and I think the more orderly way, uh, if it's okay with the committee, would be to, like, uh, Julie uh, Ellis to come up and just tutor us a little bit on the state of affairs of that patient DHS meeting and then the follow-up meetings. Uh, and then we'll, uh, maybe Ms. Abderholden can do a, a brief overview of Senate File 3395. And I see there's testifiers that are similar on both those. And then, uh, someone can speak on behalf of the county attorneys and go through Senate file 3728 and then we can people react to kind of both as a composite I have a feeling that the answer is going to be some blend of all of that And so we're, we're looking for solutions here. And so I think that does that seem reasonable to everybody? Um, Miss Ellis um, as you come I want to point out to the members on the um, and thanks to Miss Stevens for pointing out this piece of statute uh, there's a two pages of statute in your three, four, whatever, four pages of statute. Anyway, uh, 253B.15, uh, and then paragraph D is especially my interest, uh, Ms. Uh, Ellis, as you come. It says the provisional discharge plan shall be reviewed on a quarterly basis by the patient, designated agency, and other appropriate persons. Uh, the agency, and it seems like it's mostly the county. Um, and then it talks about some other things. And so I'm curious, like what I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is where's the gap in the gap? And so if we pass a law, are we even gonna make things any better or are we gonna make it worse? We thought passing the 40 hour rule was a great idea. Oh, we shouldn't get people out of jail if they have mental illness. And, and now we're, some people probably have come to a bad outcome because of that. So Ms. Ellis, welcome to the committee. Um, so we're trying to, what we're, with, with this part here is just establishing the current level of what we're doing and then we'll talk about possible solutions. So Ms. Ellis, are you there? 
I'm here. Oh, hey. Good Welcome. afternoon, Chair Abler and the committee. Um, I'd just like to introduce myself quickly. My name is Julie Ellis. I'm the Director of Adult and Disability Services for Stearns County Human Services. Um, I'm going to try to speak very succinctly about my understanding of provisional discharge, and this is from the county perspective. So, you know, hearing this maybe after DHS's presentation might sound a little bit different. Um, what I'm going to tell you about is um, what our practice and procedures have been that we've been following in conjunction and in partnership with DHS. Um, so I'll go through it fairly good. quickly. Yeah. Okay. And then if you have questions when I get done, I will try to answer them. Um, but um, I just wanted to also say thank you to Michelle Simpson for being with us today. I'm so sorry for your horrific loss. Um, and I'm hoping by having the conversations um, that we're having today, we can prevent such things from ever happening again. So thank you for being with us today and um, giving us your ideas as well. So under Minnesota statutes, again, I'm not an attorney, I'm a director, so um, I don't want to uh, misrepresent myself at all. Um, but the statute that Senator Abler referenced, 253B.15, does speak to provisional discharge of someone who has been civilly committed. Um, so when a patient is civilly committed and is cared for in a hospital bed provided by DHS, DHS staff can provisionally discharge a patient if they no longer require hospital level of care. If the patient is committed under mentally ill and dangerous statute, the court must be involved in that decision. Um, but with that exception and um, sexually dangerous, that provision, um, DHS has the authority to provisionally discharge. So in order to do that, a plan has to be developed with the county, and Senator Abler, you are right, it normally is county staff that are involved. I'm not sure why the statute says um, the appropriate um, I forget the actual words, but it doesn't say county, but it generally is the county. So it's the county, DHS staff, and the provider um, work on this plan to address the placement. They address services that will be provided. They address goals for a final discharge and conditions and restrictions of the patient. If they're being discharged from DHS facility, if they're in a different hospital setting, we coordinate with that setting. DHS staff must approve the community placement if they're leaving a DHS setting. I want to stress that a little bit because um, counties get kind of stuck here if we make a recommendation and if DHS won't approve it, we, are not, we don't have the ability to actually get them out of the hospital until it is approved by DHS. The provider, county staff, and DHS staff will meet and review progress regularly, no less than quarterly. Quarterly meetings happen for clients who are committed as MIND or sex offenders. When people are in the community or in any treatment, we attempt contact monthly. Meetings will occur more often if needs change, if the plan is not followed or other conditions or concerns exist. Services will be changed and added as necessary. The goal is to provide for a successful, excuse me, final discharge to the community for the patient. These changes happen through a variety of sources. Oftentimes a probation team will be involved, the county attorney's office will be involved, the treatment team, family, and such. If the plan is not being followed or a threat exists to the safety of the patient or the community, the provisional discharge can be revoked by the court. The patient then needs to return to the hospital. However, if a bed is not available, the patient may wait in the community. Um, and I think that's the malingering that Michelle Simpson uh, referred to that some people kind of get stuck um, when they are revoked on their provisional discharge because there isn't a bed available. Um, I just learned we have somebody in our jail right now that is awaiting placement at Anoka and there isn't a bed for him and he, he will be in our jail until there is a bed available for him. So I think that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight a little bit that might be one of our gaps, um, that there aren't enough appropriate beds. We did used to have a bed that we could actually transition people um, and that type of bed is no longer available. So when people have to go directly back to the hospital, um, there isn't always room for them right away, um, and they do have to wait. Sometimes that has a happy ending, and sometimes it really deteriorates the condition of that person, and they're in worse shape than what they were before. That's um, just a really succinct look at what, from the county perspective, what this process really looks like of provisional discharge. Well, thanks. And I just have a couple of questions just to clarify that I'm, mm -hmm. you're on a good track here. So uh, 
So does anybody know how many of these individuals there are in Minnesota? Do you know? You know how many you, you know how many your county has, right? On provisional discharge? Yeah. I, mean, I don't care how many there are, but you know everyone you know every one of them. Yeah. And what percentage um, of individuals uh, don't make it to a quarterly meeting? Do they all make it to a meeting somehow or do they some not they just disappear? We go to them. Um, they don't I don't I don't know that we've had anyone disappear. I think we have had one person um, who had left the state and um, I don't I don't but think they that they mostly they mostly so the compliance to your knowledge is people it's not like some of the populations that are just hard to find. They, these individuals avail themselves or they're gonna go back somewhere, right? It's pretty pretty successful, yeah. yeah. A high percentage, I would say, right. um, complete the plan. Um, do they ever get committed again? You know, sometimes, if we could maybe provide more intensive case management on a long-term, ongoing basis. Um, but, you know, after a point, our services become voluntary. And we have a lot of success stories where people have done exactly what they need to do and are healthy functioning members in the community. All right. Um, let's take questions now on the current, I could have many more questions, but this is, you know, this is a judiciary thing and it's us. So we have the DHS piece of this, which is why we have the counties and DHS and there's no one from the court really to talk today, which is not our department. So any questions for uh, anybody who's spoken so far about how things are now? Okay, um, I just feel like I'm, so let me ask one more question and then we'll move on to Ms. Abder Holden and Senator, you can come down and Senator Senjum if you want to sit at the table. Um, so um, the people that you're talking to every three months come hang around and they do their thing and they never quite get competent, what happens to them? I think it depends on where you live, unfortunately. Um, and you know that's one of the reasons I would really advocate for um, this forensic navigator to be held in the state, not necessarily DHS, but maybe in the court system, to assure that the services that are received and provided are the same in all 87 counties, because otherwise it is going to look different. Um, I can tell you in our county, and I'm really glad you asked this question, because um, competency isn't just about mental illness, it's also about uh, cognitive deficiencies. And right now we are experimenting with a, a different type of process to work with those individuals to provide stabilization services in the community, um, because they never will be restored, quite likely they don't have the cognitive functioning to ever be educated enough to understand the process. Um, so that's the long-term commitment that we have to those individuals um, to make sure they're in the proper setting, um, to be sure if they have new needs that come up that we're responding to them proactively instead of waiting for that next misdemeanor charge to come up. It might not be a perfect process because we're dealing with human beings, um, but that's what we're trying, and I think there could be different approaches that um, you know different counties could try. But um, for somebody with a cognitive um, disability, it, it is going to be very difficult um, to think about ever restoring them, or you know what does that look like then? It does look right. different, and I think there's some confusion about when we talk about gap cases and competency restoration that there's a whole population that looks very different. Right. Um, and so a person commits a misdemeanor, they go assault somebody at a misdemeanor level. Uh, does the group find out about that? The every three month meeting, does that come up as a discussion? Do you get police reports and stuff? In the provisional discharge? No, in your meetings, um, at the county level meetings. The, the DHS is gone, they're oh. in their plan, you get together and how's it going? And they've had two misdemeanors this quarter. Do you know that when you're in your I think meetings? we'd be meeting before, yeah. If there was a new charge, you know, if something like that happened, we wouldn't wait for the quarterly meeting. We'd be talking about that as soon as it would probably be the provider um, of the Earth's facility or wherever the person is being housed. They would probably call that meeting um, because that would be a, a major change and it would probably be a violation of the plan because there are certain things written in the plan in that provisional discharge that the patient needs to comply with. Yeah. Um, so if they picked up a new charge, yeah, we'd be we'd be meeting um, very soon. Yeah, well, just what, what I'm getting at is there's people in foster care and 
board and lodge, which are very casual, where there's not really much of an operator. Um, a bunch of them were homeless, um, at least on this list that we had. Um, some were living in their own home. So I'm just, um, just, so I mean, there's, I think there's some successful cases and some unsuccessful cases. And I think the ones you hear about are the unsuccessful ones where they, somebody, but so the police doesn't tell you. You don't have a, a line from the police department in your county or you don't read the whatever, the, however you'd find out about who did what. You don't do a records check on that to see if they did anything. Is that right? Well, again, I, I do think, unfortunately, it depends on what county you live in. Smaller counties know their people and most likely they are communicating that instantly. Um, if it is someone that's out on a provisional discharge, we have a very close relationship with law enforcement in our community. Um, and we yeah. would, most likely, they'd be picking up the phone and telling us, and that has happened. Huh. Um, and, you know, we're looking at a provisional discharge, um, many of those instances when that happens. Okay. Um, is there an automatic process in place, if that's your question? I don't believe so. Yeah. Okay. Again, you know, that would be a very good reason to have this look consistently across the state. No, I appreciate that, and that. this is, it's been very helpful, and so it's, it, I think that what's really got under, got our attention is, the word casual is the wrong word, but the, the two, the non-systematic approach, uh, and the non, you know, anyway, so that, and, and the, the casual connection, it, anyway, so um, we have two bills we want to uh, be exposed to today. And Ms. Abderhold, and you're here with Senator Sendrum. Do you think you could, what I'd like to have is just kind of a, a brief review of what your bill does, like in 10 minutes at the most. Um, and Senator Sengem, you can start off. And then I'd like to have the same thing on the other bill. And I know that there's a two-pager on that, which I know we can go through in 10 minutes. Um, and then we're gonna discuss that. And then there's a few amendments we have to talk about. Um, so Ms. Abderholden, are you here? And Senator Sengem, I see you are. Do you wanna start out, Senator? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I'm sorry, Senator Senjum. I just, I wanted just one question of clarification. Yeah. Mr. Chair, you had mentioned um, that there's a judiciary piece uh, to what we're seeing here in a human services piece. Right. And I'm wondering if, for me, if you could describe from your perspective what, where the, where the boundary is there, what you want us to drill into in this committee when you think about the DHS piece? Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you. Doesn't mean I have a good answer for That's it. That's all right. But, but uh, actually partly why I'm saying that is we're not gonna get deeply into the court side of this, that we're gonna leave this committee with questions answered, unanswered about how this best works. This is absolutely a work in progress. Um, the county attorneys have been, the people have been frustrated with this thing since the 70s, I'm told. And it's, um, and so I'd like to have something happen that will stem the tide of the randomness. And so I think the role of the county in this is very important. You saw I kind of drilled down on that. Um, we haven't talked about how the court decides who they're going to deem to be incompetent or not, how they decide that. I, we're not going to get into that part. That would be something that they might want to redefine, but not here. And, you know, if you have a question, go ahead and ask it. I'm not trying to stop that. I, I'm just trying to have us do our, I'd like to, if we don't move it out today, I'm not sure when we're ever going to. And so, but I want to give it a reasonably fair hearing. And the, for those who want to weigh in on this um, and make a difference behind the scenes, I would love that. Uh, Senator Begum's going to be here sooner or later. She's a, a co-author on this and on the Judiciary Committee as well. So, um, does that help? So, anyway, um, Senator Sendrum, do you want to say hello? And uh, well. Senator Murphy, do you want to move his bill for him? That'd be great. That'd be neighborly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would move for this hearing, Senate File 3395. Thank you very much. Senator Senjum, welcome to the committee. Uh, thank you, We're Mr. Chair and members. Uh, somehow I think this bill is going to be a journey <laughs> yeah. as, we, as we've gotten into it. And, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, I got into this... Uh, mental illness thing, at least publicly, about maybe five years ago, and I thought, uh, at least from a bonding perspective, that we ought to move forward with some crisis centers across Minnesota, and so, if you will, I outed myself and I outed my family with respect to uh, 
uh, you know, a life history of mental illness, not personally, but certainly in my family. And, uh, and that, uh, that led me, I guess, to be a candidate to offer this or author this bill. And so in uh, 2019, I think it was Mr. and Ms. Abraham that came to me and asked if I would do this. Uh, and, uh, and I consented. And as we think about this, uh, and uh, I, coming down the elevator today, I'll have to admit, uh, you know, sometimes when you're legislature, you, you would hope that uh, you've got a problem and, uh, okay, one, two, three, four, five, this is the solution, and you could write it on a piece of paper and be done with it. And you, frankly, uh, in many cases, uh, a common person could understand what you said. Uh, yeah. And so now we have a bill of 23 pages of uh, intense legalese to describe at least how we're going to move forward with this, uh, with this uh, matter. And, uh, and it's all good. It's all, I hopefully, properly written. I'm sure it'll be amended along the way. But it's, it's interesting uh, what, we, what we need to do within the world of, of law to get from here to there. And uh, so all I'm saying in a very indirect sort of way, this is a complex bill. Yeah. It's a complex subject, and I appreciate being here today and being a small part, perhaps, in, uh, in maybe finding the, uh, a solution or at least a, a, a path to, to a journey that will take us to a solution. So, so Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senate File 3395 is, has to do with competency rep rest uh, restoration, as we've all talked about here for now, maybe a half an hour. Uh, and it all started, uh, again, with a bill in 2019 that I authored that had to do with uh, creating a task force to study this for a couple of years. And uh, that task force did come together. It did work. There was about 27 members, I believe. Uh, Ms. Aberholm was, a, uh, was the chair of that. Uh, uh, Mr. William Ward, uh, one of the public offenders, was involved as the vice chair. And, uh, and they worked ardently. And, uh, and produced a report, and I believe February of 2021 is when it came out. There, there was an interim report, uh, and I'm not going to tell you about what competency restoration means because I think uh, that's been well described as we've, uh, as we've talked uh, already today. Uh, but basically, this bill, uh, and I think I'm going to really shorten this up. It, it's, it seeks to provide a path. Uh, where in a legal path, wherein people that are, have been adjudged incompetent uh, uh, might find their way to competency. It's not necessarily guaranteed, but certainly an ardent effort to get them to competency, to get them to uh, the justice system, to, 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 have their, to have their case heard and to have justice administered if that's, if that's the will of the court. And uh, so that is, I think, in essence, the bill. That's why we're here. That's why we have 23 pages of legalese in terms of the pathway to get there. Uh, it involves a lot of structure and a lot of procedure. And I think with that, I'm going to just turn it over to Ms. Aberhone, and maybe she can get into further detail if the committee wants it. Uh, but I would just say, I think, from a human services point of view, and. Uh, that's what you folks do. I think your decision, if not to make it for you, but it would be, is this an important enough issue to move on out of this committee into the judiciary so we can deal with the, the legalese and we can decide whether or not this is the correct path procedurally to get us there. Uh, it either is or it's not, and that's probably going to be decided in another committee, but uh, is this enough? Is this enough uh, an important enough issue to take forward? And I. I the more I've learned about it, and I've studied it, frankly, a great deal, I think that it is. And uh, I think that uh, this committee can uh, start this journey for this important issue right here today. And uh, I hope that you do. Thank, Thank you. you. So uh, Ms. Abra Holden, and uh, you've been around my committees long enough to know what I ask for when I ask for a, kind of a, a philosophical review of, of, of a topic. Um, and for the purpose of this committee, I would appreciate not going through 23 pages, but and not going through <laughs> the task force report that I've read, uh, interim and copies that you spent two years working on. But kind of the philosophy that you've got and what's expressed here in a in a theme. And then I'm going to ask the um, uh, the other authors of the bill. I'm the author, but the other uh, proponents of that bill that do the same thing, so we can understand the theme. So once we understand what it is we want to do, we can put it into words. 
And I think we first, we're still at that level of ideas about what shall we do. And so Ms. Abderholden, if you could do five minutes on the theme of the bill, I would really be grateful about that. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Um, Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI, Minnesota. I do wanna make sure though that members have some data that's important to really view this whole thing. Um, so the number of cases where a defendant was examined for competency increased 73% from 2014 to 2018. And judicial branch spending rose 40% during that same time period, topping off at 6 million spent in 2018 on forensic exams alone. So this created a huge strain. And we weren't serving people well. Of all those evaluations that were done, only between 41 to 44% were found incompetent. Of those who were found incompetent, only 41% were committed or had a stay of commitment. So these are kind of the gap cases. And there are three versions, right? So one is people who are found incompetent but who don't meet the commitment standard. So you can't commit them to treatment. Then you have people who are found incompetent and are committed, but they're discharged when they no longer need hospital level of care but are not yet restored to competency. And the third group is people who are unable to be restored to competency and don't meet the standards to be committed or to remain in jail. So those are three gap cases. And, you know, I do want to say that it's important to remember and, you know, um, uh, to Michelle Simpson, my heart goes out to you in, in losing a child. But a whole lot of the people who commit misdemeanors, they, they are not violent. Um, you know, there are a lot of kind of very low level kinds of cases. And um, as Dr. Stevens mentioned, people who are incompetent are not inherently more dangerous than anyone else that's released from jail. I think the other thing you have to remember in all of this is, um, you know, some constitutional requirements. You can't keep people longer um, than they would have spent in jail for the for the for their um, their sentence of 90 days, and so you have to keep that in mind too. Um, the task force that looked at this, you know, really did include all the stakeholders. So we wanted to make sure that you know anyone who touched the basically you know the elephant, so to speak, that we saw each other's views on this. Because we can sit there and say to a forensic examiner, we want it done in this amount of time, and they can say, well, there's no way that we can do it in that amount of time. So it was really important to have everyone at the table. Um, and again, county attorneys, public defenders, we had um, you know, forensic psychiatrists, uh, community mental health providers, uh, victims, we had everyone at the table. And we really did research um, about what was happening across the country and because this isn't just happening in Minnesota, and what were the things that we could do. So we examined the process people go through before and after they're found incompetent. We tried to understand why there'd been an increase in the numbers. We looked at the sequ sequential intercept model to determine where we could divert people from the criminal justice system. We looked at the gap cases and learned more about people's constitutional rights. We had presentations from people who were piloting competency restoration programs in the community. We even conducted a survey of jails. And the reason I share this with you is to help you understand this was a very active task force that took its charge very seriously. And um, we came together to try to create recommendations. I will mention there were three other huge work groups um, looking at this as well. Um, there was the 2016 Robina Institute, the 2019 Minnesota State Court Psych Services Work Group, and the 2020 National Work Group that included um, the Council on State Government Justice Center and a whole bunch of others. And I was actually on all three of those and so really got to learn about what the recommendations. And most of the recommendations across all of these groups was pretty much the same. You know, we should build the mental health system. We need to educate the judicial branch and criminal justice partners on mental health, including the community mental health system expand opportunities for diversion, limit the competency restoration process to cases that are inappropriate for dismissal or diversion, so don't do it for everyone, improve efficiency at each step, conduct evaluations and restoration in the community whenever possible, and provide high quality and equitable evaluations and restoration services. And so the bill that's before you reflects many of these recommendations. There are some other bills that have also been introduced to deal with things like um, education of judges and creating locked earth facilities, residential facilities in the community for competency restoration purposes. So the bill does a couple of things. One, it takes the Rule 20 uh, process and puts it into statute um, so that it's more easily changed uh, when we need to. It allows the courts to order someone to treatment without being committed. 
So that kind of covers that first gap case, right? So people who don't meet the commitment standard but clearly need treatment, the judge will actually be able to order that, including medications, which is part of an amendment that will be offered in the House. Um, not requiring numerous competency exams when it's unlikely that someone will ever be restored, or for someone when it's a nonviolent crime and the timelines are such, again, those 90 days, that it doesn't make sense to um, conduct an exam. We create timelines to ensure timely responses. And again, this was with input of both you know, a, a judge and the um, psychiatrist who conduct these exams to make sure we were doing things that were realistic. We would allow competency restoration um, in the community and in jails. Um, the person is often waiting there for a period of time. Why not start right away and help get them to, to become competent? And then to make sure that we don't just kind of lose people um, because many of them don't necessarily have a case manager, health insurance, or housing, is we would appoint what we're creating a forensic navigator who would create a plan for services and connect the person to those services before they leave the jail or are dismissed and to actually follow along a person in the competency restoration process. And this is gonna be someone who has a mental health background but also becomes trained in kind of the criminal justice system so that they know that piece as well. Um, I, I will say that, you know, this isn't a perfect bill. Um, it is huge. We took on a huge, huge topic, but it does take a step forward to address a problem experienced in Minnesota and across the country. We've continued to work with stakeholders on amendments since the bill was introduced and will continue to work towards creating a consensus. I do think it's really important that we've had the stakeholders at the table and that we are really trying to create a consensus on a bill that is this huge. There are things I know that people would like to do, but they aren't constitutional. Um, there, this bill will cost money. Forensic navigators won't be free, but again, we think it's an important piece. Some of those other community services that we need to do also won't be free, um, but it's something that we need to do. So thank you for the opportunity to represent the task force here today. Well, thanks, Ms. Abberholm. That was a very good summary and I think really enlightening on all of it. So thank you so much for that. Um, and now I don't know who's presenting uh, the next Senate file, uh, 3728. Um, Ms. Haas, is, are they on Zoom? Okay, a Zoom person. And so uh, who is that going to be? Is that, um, where'd my list go here? Lost my list. Anyway, speak up wherever you are. <laughs> Is that it's Mr. Carey? Me, yes, Tim Carey. I'm an assistant Ramsey County attorney. I work in the commitments division. Uh, I served on um, the task force um, and helped um, with the legislation Ms. Zabner Holden just presented on. And I also worked for the last several years since at least 2017 with the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, uh, trying to identify some way to fix the system um, that we indeed um, would like to uh, develop better outcomes for. Thank you for your interest in this. And and Mr. Carey, you probably are, have got the idea, but so um, now on this, it's a little different exercise than before. Um, and so I'd like to know where you agree with the philosophy of the other bill and where you find it's a little different. And, and then we're gonna let, we have a dialogue beginning with that with other people that are gonna testify. So um, thank you. You probably thank thought you. of that anyway, but thank you. Uh, the, um, the major points of agreement um, are that we also agree that the Rule 20 should be replaced with a statute, um, that um, by allowing the criminal court to direct people with care to care without having to go through the process of uh, meeting the commitment criteria, we do address the first gap in the process uh, for which many people do not qualify for services uh, under a court order. Uh, we also agree with the um, the idea of competency restoration services being made available in jails uh, to expedite people's return to competence um, so that the criminal uh, charges can be resolved in, in whatever way is appropriate um, and to also allow for competency restoration within the community. We um, absolutely agree with the appointment of a forensic navigator to help plan for, identify what services are necessary for a person uh, plan for those services and meaningfully connect a person to those services and uh, certainly agree with the requirement that a forensic navigator have both a forensic uh, or a mental health background and training in criminal justice. 
Um, I think one of the most important areas of um, concern, I think your language was, where's the gap within the gap? And I, I think what uh, the, the system that exists now has a disconnect between um, the mental health system, the provisional discharge planning process, which is solely aligned with clinical decision making, as Dr. Stevens um, just testified earlier today. Um, our bill would allow for um, reports uh, that relate to a conditional release violation of the treatment conditions that the person's been ordered to by a criminal court, that those violations would be reported to the criminal judge. And a criminal judge would um, absolutely consider the uh, clinical concerns raised by the violation, if any, but would also conduct a public safety analysis based on the report that's before the court and any other prior reports uh, made to the court. And at that time, the judge um, looking not only at the clinical concerns, but also the public safety issues could um, direct the person to secure treatment, which at this point in the um, available services is only available through uh, the Department of Human Services, um, or to a jail-based competency restoration program, which would um, essentially need to be developed. Um, we, we see this as a good way to try to bridge um, the disconnect between the, the clinical considerations of a person with a mental illness and the public safety concerns that can arise when a person has um, dual diagnosis of a mental illness with a substance use disorder, uh, which can dysregulate a person significantly. Um, and require structured environment for the person to recompensate and stabilize. Um, it also gives the court the authority um, to do something that the court doesn't currently necessarily have the authority to do uh, within the, the realm of the treatment through commitment. Um, I would also uh, highlight that our bill would, um, would allow for targeted misdemeanors that are defined in statute, which include D DWIs, um, fifth degree assaults, domestic assaults, and decent exposures, and domestic abuse, no contact, order violations um, to remain um, live uh, rather than to call for immediate dismissal. Oh, that was pretty, pretty quick. Um, and I, I think that uh, this is the kind of bill that people are like, oh, I see that, oh, I see that. Um, and so that's our challenge now is to kind of react to that. Um, I, I, so at some point we'll let members ask questions, but I, there's a, a Ms. Clark, you're here. Uh, we kind of hoping you could enlighten us. You've been many things in the past. Now you're a county commissioner and it's good to have you here. Uh, do you want to offer your comments, please? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. It's good to see you. Uh, really appreciate the work that all of you are doing on this. I'm Terrell Clark. I'm a Stearns County Commissioner. Um, I currently serve also as the Association of Minnesota Counties Health and Human Services Policy Committee Chair. And um, I, too, participated in the Competency Restoration Task Force. The information you've already received um, I think really sets out how complicated this is. It's actually probably more complicated than we could get into. So I want to thank you and Senator Sengem and others that are working on this. And Ms. Simpson, as a mom, that was just so heartbreaking. And it reinforces the importance of this work. Uh, so Mr. Chair, I'm going to try to address your questions. Um, I, I do want to reinforce that um, the Minnesota Association of Counties supports the effort to reform the way we're providing competency restoration services in the state. Um, as you've heard, it is really only to a pretty small um, group of individuals. And our task force really took serious our charge deep into this issue, including, honestly, you almost got a report that started with prevention and diversion because the broader connection that Senator Sengem talked about at the beginning is also really important. So. Um, we also support the significant need for prevention and diversion, stabilization, the ERTS facilities, um, including for those whom competency is unattainable, such as those with cognitive disabilities. As you heard, much of the work occurs outside the court system, before and after court proceedings. We're doing some pretty cool things here in central Minnesota, as are other parts of the state, if you're interested at some point in time hearing about that. They really are big community 
um, partnerships to work together. And there are clearly a lot of gaps, I would say in statute, but also in terms of resources, including um, safe placements, opportunities for people to make it through into a different, safer and better life. So there is an immediate need to reform competency restoration and enact legislation that will create this path moving forward for Minnesota, as well as those other components. Um, you've heard the historical components, competency restoration having been provided and still provided at St. Peter's and state pilots, but currently there really is no infrastructure, statutory directive, regulatory framework to provide these services by other entities outside of what the state has done. So this, this bill is a good step and the work of the task force is a good step at identifying a solution. We really do wanna keep working to together like we do in our communities um, as we move through this process before there's final passage. So we have concerns about the language related to pretrial supervision for those found incompetent to stand trial and also for those found unlikely to attain competency in the reasonably foreseeable future. Many counties don't have the resource to provide pretrial services. The bill directs the court to determine whether the defendant needs pretrial supervision and gives the authority to place that person on pretrial supervision with a willing entity. That may or may not be a county, but that's the language right now. Uh, currently, the bill does not appear to contain the funding for supervision, which could last up to three years for felony files. In addition, who administers and provides these new services? Competence rest restoration, education, and forensic work is still not settled. At this point, as you all know, um, the bill charges the court with administering the navigators, um, the services in each of the 10 judicial districts, and the charges the courts with establishing competency restoration programs in each judicial district. Um, we thought it was important to clarify something. There is often a fundamental misunderstanding about competency restoration and its interplay with civil commitment. Individuals can be, I just wanna reinforce this, can be de deemed incompetent without being civilly committed. Also, after civil commitment has ended, a person may still be deemed incompetent to stand trial despite having their mental health issues stabilized, or it might not be in mental health issues that are primary to barrier to competence. It may be cognitive or other issues that lead them to not being competent. So a quick example, Colorado is one of the places that we looked at with the task force and certainly um, the county social service administrators are looking at Colorado as well. They've offered through the judicial system these forensic navigators and it's great, this is what we're trying to build off of. They've reported high percentage of persons served by navigators have cognitive disabilities and mental illness was a secondary issue if presented at all. Um, so that's something for us just to be aware of as we're going through this. Um, I think Ms. Ellis addressed several of your questions that I was thinking, looking at to address right now. I'm just checking to see. Um, the other piece that has come up um, that we've heard um, outside the context of this hearing from the courts is a concern about conflict of interest of who might be the entity with the forensic navigators. We are concerned if um, it is not placed with the, with the courts that you consider something like guardian litems with the state. Because as you've just heard, DHS partners with counties for coordination of therapeutic treatment within the community while the person is still under commitment upon discharge, so that for that smaller group. In order to do that coordination, the county social service worker has to create trust and understanding. And any reporting to the court would deteriorate that trust and create a conflict of interest for the social worker if the actions of reporting to the court would end in the car incarceration, which is not necessarily beneficial to the client with mental health issues. Thus, the duty of conflict between the duty of care for the social worker and the responsibility of a forensic navigator. Um, 
So those are a few of the, the issues there. We really do think it makes sense to have something that is consistent statewide as this bill um, has laid out. Um, as far as Senate file 3728, we haven't had a chance to fully vet the language um, and we promise to get back to you with that. You know, there are some similar questions about assigning an entity or an agency uh, conducting supervision. Is there a new obligation? Um, the order to secure treatment facility, the, the, the capacity issues, we absolutely believe we need more capacity. If you're ordered to a jail program, those also don't exist. So there's, there's some questions that some counties have raised with regard to involuntary medication. Um, let's face it, part of this really is about making sure there are the financial resources, the placement resources, and the staff that is properly trained to deal with and meet the needs of, of what our goals are. So I just did that really fast, Mr. Chair. Fortunately, I know that you are capable of listening very quickly. Yeah, listen fast. Um, well, I appreciate that a lot. Um, of the people who were signed up to testify, um, I think we've kind of covered most of that. Did Mr. Flynn, did you want to say anything different than what Mr. Carey said, or are you just kind of back up? Okay. Uh, I'm just back up today, Senator. Thank you. Sweet. Yeah. Hey, I like your suit. I think we have the same color going. Um, uh, questions from members? That's Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also want to appreciate uh, Ms. Simpson. Um, uh, thank you for your uh, for speaking, and I'm really sorry for your loss. Um, I have a question, and I'm not sure who who to direct it to, but um, maybe maybe Miss Abderholden or the no, chair. Just say the just say the question. We'll yeah. Um, uh, out of the folks that are deemed to be incompetent in court, I wonder what the percentage is of uh, BIPOC folks or people of color. Would anyone happen to know that data or yeah. information? Yeah, Ms. Abderholden, you want to take a crack at it, or Mr. Carey? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Senator, I, I don't have that data, um, but we can try to get it. I, I believe okay. there was some data in the psych services report, um, so I will quick look and see if there's something in there. Okay, anybody else know offhand? Uh, if we have that information, it would be for Ramsey County only, and oh. I don't have that immediately available. That's fine. That's how would you think to answer? So, anything else, Senator Fate? Um, yeah, and I guess the follow up would be what was the makeup of the task force? Uh, Ms. Abderholden, she kind of specified a little bit. Yeah, there. I missed a little I've, I've actually yeah. got the whole list here if you want to look at the report. Okay, I'll um, get the list I'll from the chair then. To you. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty comprehensive list. Um, and so, I mean, ask anything else. That's good. That's okay. only two main questions. Thank um, you. So, Mr. Abderholden, um, you have, uh, it, I mean, it's hard to have a task force that big and come up with a report that everybody likes everything in. Yeah. Um, and I think that the product of the second bill is some of that holdover concern. And um, so I appreciate the where you're going. I would, um, the other members have questions? I just want to make sure I don't keep the other people from engaging here. Senator Fonte. Yeah, I just want to say thank you all so much for working hard on this. I know it was a lot, um, but. Um, I just want to appreciate everyone for their efforts on this. So oh, thank yeah. you. Um, and so since we're uh, discussing, Ms. Abdul, do you just want to comment on the other bill? Did they get the comment on yours? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. I mean, we do, have, we do have some concerns with the bill. Um, for example, you know, some of the definitions um, like examiner, actually in the Commitment Act, we have court examiner. Um, we want to make sure that those things line up. Um, the definition of mental illness is not uh, directly from, for example, Chapter 245, which we think that would be helpful. Um, we also are concerned that it doesn't, at least the way that I read it, um, we wouldn't be di dismissing misdemeanors, um, including nonviolent misdemeanors. And I don't think that we really want to do exams on all of them when, you know, again, they're going to be, they're going to meet their, um, sentence in 90 days. Um, 
And then some of the timelines, like the reports of the examinations, I mean, we, we listened um, to the um, psychiatrists, the forensic psychiatrists, about how long things took and what was reasonable. And so we have some concerns with that. We also included substance use disorder in our bill in terms of what the report of the examination would be. That's not included in here. Um, we know that there was an issue about um, both parties being able to appeal a decision. Um, the public defenders um, do have an issue with that. Um, uh, they called them bridge plans. We called them dismissal plans. I mean, there's some changes there. Um, there were also um, some issues related to um, information sharing. Uh, forensic navigators are not clinicians, and they're really helping develop you know, the, the plans, the service plans for people in the community, and so I'm not sure why they would necessarily need access to everyone's medical records. Um, also, um, the, the term of secure treatment facility in the Commitment Act, secure treatment facility only refers to the Minnesota Security Hospital. And so um, actually in the amendment that we're working on on the House bill, we come up with locked treatment facilities so as not to confuse people. Um, let's see, um, also the re some of the report requirements um, that's down on uh, lines 12.4, because for misdemeanors, again, you have that 90-day issue, it, it doesn't seem to mesh uh, to us. We're not sure how that's going to actually work. Um, the administration of neuroleptic medications, we worked very closely um, with, for example, the Ombudsman's Office on uh, that language to make sure that, again, everyone kind of agreed or at least could live with the language. And so um, our language uh, that will be amended onto the other bill is, is different. And then on procedures upon restoration to competence, they mentioned the head of the program sending a written report to the court. And then again, also that they believe a, de a defendant is competent. And I, I will point out that we have the word belief in our bill and the county attorneys told us we couldn't put the word belief in there. So just kind of wanting to mention that fact. Um, but also it's not the head of the program. It would be the forensic um, psychiatrist that, or examiner that would be looking at that. Um, so those were those were some of the, you know, That's some helpful. of the things we, yeah. I mean, so and and again, um, we're trying to bring everybody in on our bill to make sure that they all, you know, can at least live with part of it. And as you know, with the compromise and trying to create consensus, um, if no one's happy, you're probably doing a pretty good job. Well, that's for a person who actually believes, uh, Ms. Abner Holden, compared to the uh, apparently county attorneys who don't believe. So they're, they're, they're paid to be, uh, you know, is this really the truth? Um, that's an effort to inject some humor into a really serious topic. Um, I have, uh, like I mentioned, I personally came into this topic uh, like July with barely even knowing this was an issue. And I've really learned, I really learned a lot from every hearing and meeting I'm in. I've been talking to my own county, my own county attorney, um, some various people, and every it, and it just like it becomes more and more complex. But it's no less important to make a step in the right direction to get somewhere to go. Um, and there's a challenge in this bill, both in the price tag and in the complexity. So if I could uh, issue a challenge to anybody who's engaged in this, including Ms. Simpson, is there something we could do that would be a small step in the right direction so we don't have any more stories about, I don't know these three cases that uh, are in front of me that I have heard of four cases or five. There's, there's not a lot, a lot of them, but there shouldn't be any. You know, a person riding a bus should think he's just riding the bus and somebody shouldn't just come up and shoot him. I mean, it's, <laughs> Did anybody see, has anybody looked at the cases that went bad where something got missed? You know, like, how did the group, did they not go to the group? Were they out of state? Did they came back? Or did they somehow escape? Um, and were they really incompetent? Uh, someone's mentioned that some new, some attorneys have found this to be a good way to get their people off. Oh, you're not competent. And which is part of what one person suspected the uptick was from a misuse of the system who people should come out, you know, and, and, and that, that would be even worse if you were an attorney that was gaming the system and your client got off and then did something terrible. 
because um, they truly knew right and wrong, but they were bent on evil. Um, but so, um, I'm, I keep waiting for uh, Senator um, Bigham to get back here to offer her thoughts, but um, so for, I think the committee is really interested in this. I think we want to be a part of the solution. And I, given how the next stop is, and maybe if this has to go to other committees as well based on data, it's gonna be complex. So my, my challenge to the public and to the people watching and to everybody, is there some small step we can take this year that can actually get done in a single hearing in judiciary and have a price tag that's reasonable enough. And I don't even know what that little missing piece is. But I think a lot of the people at home, if you could just do one thing, I mean, attorneys watching and people that are paying attention, I don't imagine. <laughs> the average citizen, they tune this out, what is this they're talking about? Um, well, sometimes we're just as challenged as you are, I'll tell you. Uh, but is there something we can do that can make this productive so we don't do nothing? Because I feel a really heavy sense of responsibility to having become aware of this and now me making all of you aware of it we all now share the responsibility. And like, oh, well, we just didn't quite get it done. And then something happens to another family in you know, July or sometime. Now that just, that would be horrible. So anyway, um, so we're, we're, that's my thought there. So there's a few amendments that we have. Um, I have uh, Senator Housley, um, we'll all take up yours in a minute. Um, and so there was a thought we should send these off to judiciary without recommendation to pass, which I think is a good idea because we don't even know what we want to pass yet. But we do want to put this on their plate to make them feel responsible as well. So uh, working with Senator Bigham, who is not here. Um, anyway, so um, Senator Housley, if you would move Senate file 3728. So we have two bills before us, actually. Um, so moved, Mr. Chair. And so uh, I'd like to move the A2 on behalf of Senator Bigham, who used to be on this committee, which puts some money into this bill um, for, uh, for corrections and under the Community Corrections Act and for county probation officers and, um, and for the Department of uh, Corrections. So it's about $4 million, um, which I have no idea how much money they need for this. But this is a committee that's telling the other committee, we know it needs some money, and out of respect to the counties who, uh, they, you can't make, um, you know, everybody has to pay something. And so this would be a state bit for, your, for 2023 um, to, as a start, uh, to maybe begin, if we do just one thing, could we do something for $4 million that would make a difference? That's the effort of this. Uh, any questions about that amendment, Senator Murphy? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just uh, as I look at this, um, is it are, are these accounts a part of the jurisdiction of this committee? Or are we adding this on to uh, the bill so it is going into a committee that would actually consider this this budgetary number? That is correct. I think not one of these is ours. So if we put this on, they'd have to go get it. But now we're saying we uh, in our committee realize this is not going to be done for free. We don't think the counties and those other groups have the capacity with their current funds to do what we're asking them to do. And so we're asking them to please think about it. And then they would decide any numbers that they chose to take out of their budget. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so yeah. just, just to be Yeah, clear, no, that's like, a really good question. Because, you know, we're not in a budget year, but there's this surplus that people have been talking there's about. There's a surplus? I've heard. Really? There is a surplus, yes. So, wow. uh <laughs> If there were targets given to committees, this would come out of a different target, not this target. That's correct. Thank you. As I understand. So I, um, anyway, any other questions about the A2 amendment? Um, Mr. Chair? I, Michelle oh. Benson, I'm on camera. Oh, hey. Thanks. Sorry. It just I, came out of the sky. Like, oh, no. Yes, like, the voice I, from, I, <laughs> yes, remote. Senator uh, Benson, uh, welcome to the remote world that you live in right Thank now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want the committee to be clear that these are ongoing appropriations. Oh, okay. Um, very good. Actually, one of them. Well, actually, no, I, I said it wrong, Senator Benson. It's two million altogether spread out, and it said in fiscal 23. So. But, yeah, Mr. Chair, it's my understanding if it doesn't say one-time appropriation, then it's ongoing. Okay. So I think we should have clarity 
before we vote. It's probably not going to change anybody's vote, but I think we should be. Well, I, I think that we in, I actually, I didn't prepare this. It came to me with the help of uh, another senator who's not here. Um, but so, uh, Mr. Monahan, or I don't know who, which of you would just, oh, hey, there you go. Could you uh, just, could you give me a little oral amendment to clarify it one time? Just so we can not commit ourselves to more money than we're planning on spending. Uh, Mr. Chair, it is one time. It is one time. Yes. Okay. I mean, I mean, it is ongoing. My apologies. It's, it's ongoing. Is, it's ongoing. It's appropriated one time one. in the second year of a biennium, and it doesn't say one-time appropriation, so okay. it will be ongoing. Um, so, for today's purposes, could you please help me declare that it's one time? Because that's good enough for me. Mr. Monahan will. Okay. <laughs> so let's let's withdraw this for now, and Senator Housley has a, the A3 amendment. Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the A3 amendment. And, yeah, please tell us about it. I'd love to, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, your legislation uh, here deals with adults, and it creates a very clear process. Um, but this, I would like to um, add juveniles. It would create a consistency in how the system treats incompetent defendants. Uh, juveniles. Juveniles are also going through um, different stages of brain development, and they're much more likely to be found incompetent and released. Uh, some juveniles are still committing serious crimes, as we've seen with the recent carjacking cases. So um, these juvenile statutes are, are more geared towards rehab than the adult correction system. Uh, we don't want to create overlap services, nor do we want to make sure that children or any children fall through the cracks. So um, it is just adding... Uh, juvenile Competency Restoration Task Force to your language, Mr. Chair. Well, thank you. And I, I think it's, I mean, I think this is a great amendment. It sets up a whole new task force to work on juveniles. And Senator Murphy had even asked the Judiciary Committee to pay for it. So <laughs> this is just the perfect amendment. Um, any uh, questions? Uh, anybody else? Uh, any of our previous testifiers want to comment about this, either for or against? And Mr. Chair, Senator Benson, M Michelle Benson again. Um, we should ask the author about this. Obviously, the the work's been done on it. It does uh, require routing through state gov as one of the additional stops when you add a task force. Right, and so unless uh, Senator Kiffmeyer waives it, so no, and I I couldn't agree more. Um, it's really eerie having you just pop in like that, Senator Benson. I just have to tell you. Um, it's like, <laughs> where did she come from? And so uh, this, this whole project is going to the um, Judiciary Committee. If they decide they want to continue with this task force, then it will properly track after that. Um, so uh, to the A3, Senator Murphy? To the, yeah, to the task force. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's been a while. It feels like a really long time since I have been in a committee where we're actually doing work. Um, and so <laughs> I appreciate um, your indulgence. Um, and as I look at this amendment, and I appreciate uh, Senator Housley's intention here that we should be thinking through uh, juveniles um, differently than adults. And I'm looking at the list of the participants in the task force and wonder if you would consider adding a pediatrician um, to the list, since we are talking about young people, um, young people in brain development. Um, it might be wise to have um, that voice uh, included in your task force. Senator Housley. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Murphy, absolutely we can add a pediatrician to the task force. So uh, staff will work on that, too. Um, Thank you, Senator Housley. Thank you. How are you guys doing there? Okay. Uh, well, that's those are being worked on. Um, we're going to start working on uh, some. So, Miss, uh, well, I'm just. Anyway, so Ms. Simpson, do you want to offer some thoughts? We're going to do these amendments in a minute, and we're going to be quitting in about five minutes. So did you, uh, what did you think about how we're doing here today, Ms. Simpson? I'm just glad everybody's talking about it finally, actually. Uh, I did, you just said, like, what are the 
You said one or two things that could be worked on. Well, I, I can yeah. just say that I heard two things. One was from the director of case management, I think. I don't remember her name, and then Tim Carey. And you said, were, are there commonalities on the... I thought, I thought there were four murders, but three oh, or four in the last two years. Sure. Um, and all the assault. I would say it would be like a standard process for revocation of provisional discharge. And right. I think that's what the case manager said. And then Tim Carey talked about having the court be able to not just consider the clinical concerns, but also the public safety analysis. I'm pretty consistent with like how I think about this. I think like if those, if those two things, public safety analysis, it's in the court, like can make a decision as to where, like if revocation is going to occur and there's this very standard process for revocation yeah. and it has to be followed, All right. that, that that, might be able to help. All right, can you do me a favor? I'll put that into an email. And so my call for this, I mean, I just don't want to go home and do nothing. I, I think that's just not responsible. I'll say that just strongly, that we have to do something. And so we're passing a bill over to another committee. Well, that's an action which hopefully will or not turn into something. So I want to help that committee to get their arms around something that we've learned today. That, And so to the people listening, the advocates, the attorneys, whoever else that is, Please help us out. So, Ms. Hoffman, let you. Do you have something, Mr. Monahan? Do you have Do you have the uh, pediatrician one? Okay, let's do that, um, Mr. Monahan or whoever. Could you read the pediatrician part since that's the amendment in front of us, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair and members? <laughs> um, Senator Murphy is proposing an oral amendment to the A3. Um, page 2, line 12, before the period, insert semicolon and, uh, open parentheses 25, close parentheses, a pediatrician appointed by the Minnesota Academy of Pediatrics. That's very nice. Uh, Senator Halsey, do you like that? Mr. Chair, I'd like it a lot. Thank you. And uh, Senator Murphy, does that get you where you want to go? I think that's a really good idea. And you could incorporate that into your amendment, Senator Halsey, if you'd like, since it's, it's an oral amendment. Uh, Mr. And Chair, I incorporate what Mr. Monahan just said into my amendment. Perfect. Any questions about the A23, or the A3 as amended? All right, so let's vote on that. All in favor of the A3 to set up a juvenile competency restoration task force and make judiciary pay for it. Please say aye. 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 Opposed? I think we even got the voice from the sky on that one. Um, okay, uh, the A2. And Ms. Hoffman, let you, do you have that, or Mr. Monahan? Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe someone needs to move the amendment again. Uh, I'll move it. Okay. Uh, so the oral amendment would be uh, page one, line five, after the period, insert, this is a one-time appropriation, period. Oh, perfect. And I'll incorporate that. And staff has noted that amendment. And uh, so just if anybody wonders, Senator Bigham was very concerned about funding burdens on counties, and so if that hasn't come up more than once today, bring it up again, we could uh, have an oral amendment to title this in a different way than corrections appropriation, but I'm not going to do that. Um, anybody, <laughs> any, any, uh, any questions about having a judiciary do some more work that we want them to do? I like, this is a really good trend. Uh, all in favor of the A2 as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed. All right. Warren's going to get a kick out of that one. Um, all right, so Senator Murphy, are you comfortable uh, moving that Senate file 3395 to be, just be moved to the Committee on Judiciary? 
without a recommendation. It just we're just going to we're not going to see recommended to pass. We're just going to say that it be referred to the committee on judiciary. I am, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, Senator Senjin, we kind of left you out of this. Do you want to say anything before we move your bill off to judiciary? Uh, no, I think uh, I think the time is time is now. So uh, let's proceed, Mr. Chair. No, just uh, it was my intent. It was so. Oh, so what? Oh, should we move the other one out first then, just because that's... Oh, I'm sorry. Fine. For the people watching at home, we've had two bills before us. One was on top of the other one. Oh, I should have helped. You know, for people who think legislators are really smart and infallible, clearly we are not. Totally. <laughs> so... <laughs> Forget it, Senator Senator. We're not moving your bill yet. <laughs> Senator Housley would like to move Senate File 3728 as amended with two very nice amendments uh, be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. That will imply it's, it's not recommended or not recommended. It's just being sent there. Everybody understand that amendment, that, that motion, including me? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Hey. We have another motion. But go ahead, Senator. No, no, if you have another motion, I, I, I wondered, I was not joking when I said do the abler. Oh, yeah, is there was... a conversation about you doing this with the two bills to send oh. it to judiciary as one package versus two? Does it make sense that way? That then No, we're would... sending them separately. You're yes. going to do it separately? Yeah, All right. People would be really confused then. So. Well, we oh. don't get confused here on that. We know. Senator Hoffman is referring to a time in the past when we combined two bills from DHS that were totally at odds and we created Article 1 and Article 2. <laughs> Correct. A bill that did not make sense. It was. And how thick was that bill, Mr. Chair? Uh, thick enough. Yes, it was. So, anyway, so, um, and I appreciate, uh, as we move Senator Senjum's bill forward, which is the task force bill, I appreciate the work. And I appreciate the voice of the county attorneys and other people that put in the other bill. And I hope that the message of all this is, is that we are committed to doing this. So maybe that's my closing comments for your bill, Senator Sanjum. Did you want to say anything else? Uh, well, Mr. Chairman and members, thank you so much for taking these bills up to date. They're certainly important. We know that. And, uh, and let's just continue this journey and see if we yeah. can get any place. Thank you. So uh, Senator Murphy would like to move that Senate File 3395 be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. Everybody understand that? All in favor of that, say aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> All right. So uh, this has been, I think, really a good hearing. And if nothing else, I think all the members who have not been spending so much time on this topic realize the complexity. And we, I think we should just for sure commend all the county and attorneys and people who try to slog through this to protect our individuals. And I hope that people understand we care about due process. We care about public safety. And bringing those together to protect everybody. And Ms. Simpson, we do so appreciate your time with us today. Um, God bless us, everyone. Uh, with that, uh, we're adjourned.